hello again. Uh, I'm uh, Asser. I'm uh, an SUT Plus uh, um, member, and um, I'm in the committee as well. Uh, today we have uh, Andrew Colony. Uh, we're gonna be talking about um, introduction to uh, subsea acoustics. Uh, and uh, I'll start with a with a small video introducing uh, the SUT as a main committee and the SUT Plus uh, uh, as well. Uh, it's just a couple of minutes and then we're going to start afterwards. I will uh, I'll give the mic now to uh, Andrew to uh, start with uh, introducing, him, introducing himself and uh, start the, the presentation itself. Thank you. Okay, yeah, uh, good afternoon and good morning to, uh, to people around the world. I'm not sure how, how far and wide we've managed to attract an audience, but I see there's quite a few people logged on today. So um, yeah, I appreciate everyone tuning in today uh, and I appreciate the, the invite from uh, ASER and the SUT Plus committee uh, to, to ask me to speak to uh, you all about subsea acoustics. Um, uh, myself, I've uh, been working for uh, for Amenco and then previous Intronics uh, for over, fi over 15 years now and uh, a lot of that's been involved in underwater acoustics so uh, hopefully I'll be able to impart some uh, some experience and knowledge over uh, gained over that time uh, in something that will be interesting and uh, and and hopefully educational at the same time. So, um, so yeah. Before starting a, a sort of icebreaker question, uh, anyone has it a guess of uh, uh, how many years uh, acoustics have been used underwater? Um, uh, something that I researched uh, for for just something interesting to to throw into the the presentation, really. Um, Acoustics have been used underwater for around 33 million years. Uh, who would have thought it? Um, uh, something that was, was developed with, uh, with, with evolving whales uh, who, who uh, evolved to, to use echolocation underwater uh, for, for navigation and hunting. So uh, however practical man-made acoustics, they've, they've been used uh, more, uh, more since the turn of the 20th century. Uh, developments started with, with underwater warning beacons uh, located near lighthouses, uh, allowing ships to detect both sound and, and light, uh, so, um, you know, to avoid uh, coming to trouble. Uh, however, sort of progressed, uh, progression development uh, following World War I, um, in all, all best technologies are developed through wars, uh, unfortunately. 
uh, and, and potentially the sinking of Titanic motivated developments of echo sounders and, and then other technologies have progressed through there. We could run through a whole history of, of development timeline of acoustics if we wanted to. But today, uh, the, you know, it's got widespread use in many ocean industries, uh, particularly uh, energy, which, which uh, a lot of us are involved in, uh, and defence and uh, ocean science. Um, so, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll cover some of the, the use cases of, of, of those today. Uh, so as a, as a very high level overview agenda, uh, we'll, a little talk about why, you know, why we want to use acoustics underwater. Uh, a bit of theory about uh, about acoustics and uh, a little bit about use cases. So uh, acoustics, it's, it allows, I mean, it's sound through water. So sound travels quite well through water. It allows a long, a long distance propagation of energy and you can modulate that energy. So it allows you to impart some, some data or some communication uh, on, on, that, on that, sound, uh, that sound wave. Um, range. I was looking up again uh, for what uh, for what things like whales can produce, uh, for what they could achieve through water, uh, and and around about fifteen hundred kilometers or or further, you know, depending on conditions, um, can you know can be achieved by by some cetaceans. Uh, practical acoustic communication, uh, man, you know, man-made acoustic communication. Uh, can be achieved over multiple kilometers. Um, so I mean, that, that allows useful communication from, from seabed to surface. Uh, and, and development of digital acoustic uh, modulation techniques allows multiple kilometer, uh, multiple kilobits per second of data rate um, over, over those useful ranges. So uh, not as much as, as you might get from, you know, gigabit internet uh, or, or you know, communication through umbilicals to trees, but, you know, allows a really useful communication path. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit through how the, the limitations of acoustics, you know, it's, it's, it's a great technology. It is limited, but hopefully through the, the limitations, we'll, we'll kind of see opportunities for, for why it's a useful technology. Uh, and, and one key thing is the what we call the sonar equation, uh, really identifies the, the, the signal to noise ratio, which is, is key for getting reliable communications through water. Uh, source level is, is the volume of, of signal that you're putting into the water, uh, the, the amount of energy that you're transmitting. Um, it's a logarithmic scale, so you know if you add three dBs of, of source level to your 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 signal. Is effectively doubling the energy required to produce, which you know could effectively half, you know, if you're running on batteries, half your battery life. So you know, a lot of things to consider there. There's also uh, with with source cell, there's a limit of cavitation. Um, sound being, being uh, effectively a pressure wave in water. Um, you know, if, if you put so much pressure into water, uh, you can cause cavitation. It's, it's sort of similar to boiling the water because there's so much energy in the water. And it's, so, so what happens with uh, propellers is uh, an image of a, of a propeller cavitating there. The, the pressure that is imparted by the pr propeller into the water causes cavitation. And it causes a broadband noise. It causes bubbles in the water, both of which uh, aren't so good for the, the, the propagation of acoustic uh, energy. Uh, Transmission loss is uh, what's, what's lost in the channel. Um, two, two factors, spreading loss due to uh, spreading the transmitted energy out over a wide area. Um, you know, for example, if you know, someone's standing next to you, they can hear you a lot better than someone that's standing quite some distance away because that energy is spread out over a much wider area. Um, however, thanks to Zoom, everyone can hear me loud and clearly today. Uh, Another, uh, another cause of, of transmission loss is uh, sound absorption through the water um, and, and high, uh, it tends to be higher frequencies are absorbed quicker, uh, absorb more readily than lower frequency, uh, lower frequencies through the water. Uh, so for, for long range uh, acoustic systems, we, we, we stick at the lower frequency range of the spectrum. Um, Noise level at the receiver, uh, you know, due to due to ambient noise, you know, if, again going back to having a conversation with someone, if 
if you're trying to have a conversation with somebody and uh, someone's shouting in your ear, there's a high level of ambient noise there, and you're going to have trouble detecting uh, what the other person is saying. Um, there's a, a, a chart here, thanks to Seish, um, which identifies different sources of, of ambient noise, both natural and man-made. Um, and you can see I mean, a lot of the stuff here is below the, the, the 10 kilohertz frequency if we, we bring the pointer over. Um, and I, I mean, typically acoustic systems will be working above 10 kilohertz anyway, just, just due, to, due to practicalities and the requirement for data rate. Um, higher frequencies, yeah, potentially good for, for, for data rate, as I said, absorbed more readily through water. So, so we want to restrict operation. Uh, in higher frequency bands. Um, directive index, index is a, a, a function of the receiving transducer. I'll, I'll speak a bit about transducers in a minute. And detection threshold is, is the capability to uh, decode the incoming sound, um, you know, how, how sensitive the receiver is. Uh, so if someone is uh, hard of hearing, they've got a pure detection threshold. Um, and, you know, if someone uh, is is quite good of hearing, then you know that would be a a, a higher factor there. Uh, the speed of sound is also a, a, something to to think about, and I'm going to break that into a few different uh, aspects here. So we'll, we'll discuss it in more detail. Um, the 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 speed of sound through water is about 1500 meters per second. So that's compared with radio signals through air, which I guess a lot of us are familiar with. Um, which travel at the speed of light, compared to that, the speed of sound is, is significantly less. So um, think about it, if, if you're one and a half kilometers away from your sensor that you're getting readings from, the, the, the time taken for that data to travel 1500 meters, uh, one and a half kilometers is gonna take one second. So if, if you're worried that your data is one second old when you receive it, then you, know, you, you need to consider how that affects uh, your, your operation. Uh, the, the Doppler effect, um, people probably know the Doppler effect as well, it's, it's, the, it's the effect of um, change in perceived, perceived frequencies uh, from, from a moving target. It's, it's the one, if a siren's, uh, you know, an emergency vehicle siren's coming towards you, the, the sound sounds like a, a higher frequency and once it moves away from you, it goes to a, a lower frequency. And the same happens from, you know, for underwater vehicles, you know, uh, the example here of an ROV trying to transmit data, uh, if it's moving, as it moves towards something that that uh, that target is going to perceive the received signals at a higher frequency. So, um, you know, we, we've got techniques to deal with that about how it, it, it translates the frequencies. But again, something that's, uh, that's that's definitely worth considering when you know when designing an acoustic system. Uh, I did I did get a fact uh, in in one of the SGT podcasts uh, about the Doppler effect. Uh, and for a swimming diver, considering the speed of a swimming diver in water is 500 times greater than what it would be for radio communications with a supersonic jet, uh, due, just due to the difference in, in speed of, of transmission. So yeah, consider that as, as a significant effect on transmitting data. Uh, also with speed of sound, it's, I said it's 1500 meters per second, but it's not constantly 1500 meters per second in water. Uh, at, at shallow depths, look, looking at this, uh, this chart here, um, in shallow water where it's warmer, uh, the speed of sound is slightly higher. And, and as you go deeper, the, um, the, the water cools. So you, you end up getting a reduction in the speed of sound. And then as you go deeper still, the pressure increases. So you end up, then getting an increase in speed of sound. So you get this, you get this minimum point. And uh, if you remember back to, to high school physics, um, some, of the, some of the best days of your life, of course, um, you, you remember refraction and, and that was caused by uh, a, a change in speed of, of speed of sound or speed of light between, uh, between media causing a bending in the signal or a bending in the beam. And the, the the practical result of this is if, if you're transmitting something from the seabed, if, if you look at this, this chart in the, the bottom right here, um, signals will, will tend to bend up from the seabed towards the surface. 
so what it means is you end up with some sort of shadow zone here, which no increase in source level is, is going to overcome. Um, however, you know, some, some things can make, uh, you can take advantage from that. Submarines who are, you know, who are hunting each other, uh, you know, can, can use this if they know the location of the other submarine. They can sit in the shadow zone, uh, so, so they, they remain undetected. Uh, also, you know, whales, they can, they can swim to this depth, um, you know, the, 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 the thermocline depth. And because you've got a minimum point, the sound will reflect up the way, but then as, as the speed of sound increases on, on the other side, it will reflect down the way again. So um, you end up getting effectively sound traveling a long distance along this channel called the, the SOFAR layer. And that's how they that's how they achieve communication over uh, hundreds of kilometers. Uh, however, in practical systems, I mean, we, we don't have the luxury of being able to to raise things up to uh, up to that level in, in most circumstances. So we're stuck with deploying stuff on the seabed or or from the surface. So we're always going to be at um, you know at the effect of of this refraction. <clears throat> Uh, also affected by uh, reflections. I mean, radio above water is uh, affected by reflections, but um, I mean, due to the speed of sound through water compared to the, the speed of radio transmission, uh, the, the effect is a bit more significant. However, we, we, we deploy various techniques to, mit uh, to mitigate these effects, uh, such as you know, digital modulation, advanced processing, and, and in the case of the refraction, uh, just careful location of, of the devices. Um, want to make sure that we're, we locate them and we can we can model it uh, to, to ensure that we get good coverage, good range uh, of, of transmission. So as, as I said, deploying techniques to, to mitigate some of the, the, the effects. Um, I mean, we, we borrow things from other digital communication methods, uh, spread spectrum technology, you know, uh, widely used in, in mobile phones uh, and, and, and other digital transmission methods. Um, spread spectrum it allows a, a much increased signal to noise ratio, um, means that you can, you can reduce the, uh, the, the source level of transmission, which has, has advantages. Um, you, you can potentially uh, have improved signal to noise over ambient noise sources um, and, and Coded means that you know sort of digital modulation with with coding uh, means that you, you reduce your, the the likelihood drastically reduce the likelihood of interference from ambient noise sources. So uh, there's there's no risk of you know a, a, a passing whale or passing fish accidentally interfering or or causing a you know a misread um, communication message. Uh, and I said, with the, the, the opportunity to reduce the source level, we can we can stay well below the level of cavitation, so we don't end up with that cavitation issue as well. Uh, and forward error correction, uh, you know, if, if anyone can remember what a CD is, uh, I don't know the last time I saw a CD, um, but I mean, they they deploy forward error correction techniques. They they uh, apply redundant data uh, within within the data packets of of the sound, and um, so it, what it means is if, if some of that data is lost, whether it be in a small scratch in the CD, in the case of acoustics, if there's you know, a, a short term burst of noise, um, the, redundant rate, the redundant data can be used to rebuild what's lost in that, in that message. Um, so, so much improves the reliability of the, the communications. So talking a little bit about, um, you know, a bit more about, oh, Sorry, excuse me. Uh, a bit more about the theory and and an introduction to some uh, system components. I'll I'll go heavily on the, um, uh, the the acoustic transducer here because it's it's very unique to acoustic communications. Uh, transducers or or hydrophones. The, the the term there's there's a difference between the term, but they're they're gen, you know a lot of people refer to one and the other as the same thing. Um, they're, they're a method of converting transmitted signals, uh, electrical signals from, from your, your system into sound uh, to propagate through the water. Uh, and, and likewise, receive sound and convert them into electrical signals, which can be decoded by, uh, for example, a DSP, digital signal processor. 
the dimensions of the transducer are directly related to what frequency or, or wavelength you're operating on. And depending on the, the, the dimensions and the mechanical mounting of the transducer, these can be designed to be directional devices. Uh, and and so looking, at, looking at the size of these, this is one of our uh, transducers, which works around about 10 kilohertz. It's, it's quite a bit bigger. Um, I guess the, the pictures are perhaps most leading, but quite a bit bigger than, than some of these um, uh, imaging devices, which are operating at hundreds of kilohertz. Uh, the, the directional transducers, um, I've got a couple of plots here. The one on the left is a, represents an omnidirectional transducer. That means that it's, it's sort of interested in receiving signals from you know, 360 degrees around it, uh, which is, is very good in some, uh, in some uh, instances. However, if you're only interested in listening to what's straight in front of you, or straight above you, uh, which may be the case if you're located on the seabed and you want to talk only with a vessel that is directly above you or within a zone, of course, but generally directly above you, uh, you would design your transducer to be directional. Uh, this one represents a, a, a directionality of about between 10 and 20 degrees. Um, and, and what it means is that, you know, you, you've got your focus of interest in that direction and it, it means that you attenuate anything that's that's to the side of you or to behind you. So, um, you know, if you've got a noisy bit of equipment sitting alongside you, then, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to be affected, affected by that ambient noise as much. Uh, most transducers are, are constructed using a ceramic element. It's a capacitive element. So normally you need some sort of inductive matching to allow them to be driven properly by uh, an amplifier. And, and that amplifier is needed to generate the power, the signal power uh, necessary to transmit signals through long distances underwater. Uh, as a wireless technology, it's, it's often necessary for devices to have their own power source. Uh, it, it kind of seems a bit silly if you've got wireless technology that you can work over thousands of, uh, thousands of meters um, and then have to uh, run a power cable down to it. So designing a, a useful battery is, is an important part of, of an acoustic system. And devices will, will, you know, they'll generally serve a functional purpose. You know, it's all very well having an acoustic modem, but, you know, you, you need it to, to serve a purpose. So usually it will be connected to some sort of sensor or driving some sort of uh, output actuator um, or, you know, sending data to uh, an AUV, for example. So considering your, uh, you know, some sort of interface as part of the system is, is important too. Um, so I was, I was comparing things to uh, through air radio communications there, and you might think, well, why do we not just use radio underwater? Um, why is that not possible? Well, it is possible, but the the, the range achievable through uh, for for radio signals through water is is much reduced. Um, there is technology out there that does it, uh, but the maximum range of it is is around about ten meters, so um, significantly less than what we could get with acoustics. However, there is a, a, an increase in possible uh, data rate through that. So around about 10 megabits per second, you'll, you'll get through a, a through water radio system. Um, you can also uh, modulate light to send data through water. Uh, free space optics are, are becoming more, um, uh, more prevalent as well. And light will travel around about 100 meters through water and, you know, depending on the conditions. Uh, and, and using that, you'll get uh, potentially a gigabit per second, potentially more. Uh, than that. Um, so, so significantly higher data rate again than, than what we can get through uh, through acoustics. Uh, and these, you know, these are very useful technologies, you know, at, at short range, but, um, you know, if, if you think of the scenario of an ROV uh, trying to recover data from a, a subsea asset, if you want to avoid having to physically connect in, you know, an electrical uh, connection into that to download data, you could use something like this to, um, to to wirelessly download data, and then you recover the EV back to surface, or or send that data um, over a longer term using it, using an acoustic link. But um, you know, if if you want 
a truly wireless communication method between seabed and sea surface, then acoustics is really your, your, your choice to go for there. So I'll go on and talk a little bit about use cases um, and try and get, get through this uh, uh, within the time. Um, but I'll, I'll say now this is not an exhaustive list and you know we could spend a lot of time going through uh, use cases of acoustic technology, but um, uh, you know if anyone's interested, I'll, I'll, I'll happily try and converse uh, at another time and, and talk more about use cases. Um, communication through water, that, that's probably a, a fairly obvious one. Um, uh, hopefully, a lot of people have heard of acoustic modems. Um, do they want do much the same as what, uh, you know, a data modem does or, you know, the router in your house, uh, you know, packetizes the, you know, a payload of data and sends that through the trans transmission media, whether it's, uh, you know, your Ethernet cable or air or, in the case of acoustic modems, through the water. Uh, potential uses for this, you know, we can upload missions to uh, to vehicles such as EVs, uh, download survey data. Um, we can remotely operate uh, subsea equipment such as actuators, uh, you know, particularly for valves, uh, flow line isolation valves as an example, blow up preventers, uh, something that uh, we do, uh, and then could do a communication system uh, to operate. Uh, or another example, mooring line uh, quick releases. Uh, we can remotely recover sensor data, uh, such as pressure, temperature sensors on uh, on Christmas trees, uh, monitor uh, pressures, temperatures, um, flow rate through flow lines and do distributed uh, measurement across the, the flow line as well at multiple locations, which would potentially be complicated to run a cable to do um, so, you know, a, a wireless solution for that has, has a very good, uh, a very good value uh, proposition for that. Um, all for all for monitoring for flow assurance, uh, which is is pretty key um, for uh, the energy industry. Uh, distributed corrosion monitoring, um, also I mean, uh, going along with the energy industry. Uh, you know, there's a lot of aging platforms out there, and and knowing exactly what the um, the structure is doing uh, in terms of corrosion is is quite important. So, distributed monitoring of that, uh, as you know, lends itself to an acoustic or wireless solution. Um, and and remote environmental monitoring. I mean, there's there's lots of systems out there doing um, you know checking conditions under the sea, tsunami mon uh, warning monitoring. You know, some of these using uh, using acoustic systems. I'll also add in uh, to, to the, the, the term of communications about uh, dive bell emergency through water comms. Uh, these things use a, a, a 25 kilohertz uh, standard modulation technique. Um, and such as the, if the dive bell umbilical gets severed during, during a dive, during, once it's deployed, then voice, you know, using this, this uh, through water communication method, voice communication between the vessel and the bell can still continue. So you can still check the status of the, the divers while you're, you're rescuing them. Um, I'll, I'll say, you know, not one size fits all for these. All these applications can be quite different uh, in terms of how long they need to be deployed. So how, how big a battery is required, um, what frequency, what data rate they need to use. So, you know, there's a lot of things to throw into the mix when, when designing an acoustic system. Uh, location tracking, uh, something that we do quite a bit of at Menko, um, uh, commonly used to track vessels uh, on the surface or, or vehicles underwater, be it ROVs or EVs, or even uh, construction hardware, uh, crane hooks, um, uh, structures that are being lowered through the water and you want to track position of those while they're being deployed to the seabed, which uh, you want to know exactly where they are once they get to the seabed. That's quite important. Um, you know, commonly used for for those purposes. And I mean, we could have a whole course on on how underwater positioning works, but I'll, I'll, I'll give a brief overview, really. But generally, requires some sort of uh, some form of triangulation to uh, reference nodes, which you you've deployed and, and calibrated and know the position of. And uh, you 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 get 
pings from from the reference beacons you know the speed of sound through water you can you can measure that um, and and then you therefore calculate the distance to each beacon and and therefore triangulate position uh, a few different methods of, of how it works um, long baseline uh, long baseline positioning involves as I said, locating multiple reference beacons on the seabed, you calibrate them into position. The asset then pings for all the beacons in range, such as this animation. Each of the beacon in range, each beacon in range then replies. And then the asset works out the distance because of the, it knows the time of flight, knows when it did a ping, knows when it's received the, the reply. It can work out the distance to each beacon and then triangulate its position. Uh, the the Amenco Nasnet system does this slightly differently. Um, it, it's a broadcast LBR system, so instead of waiting for the asset to ping, uh, each beacon is pinging uh, fairly regularly every few seconds. And and what it means is, you know, you're not tied down to, you know, if you've got multiple uh, ROVs in the water, then you're not tied down to waiting for it to ping, or the the beacons aren't tied down to waiting for the asset to ping. They just ping along, uh, along all the time. Um, it also means that each time the asset receives a ping from each reference beacon, which you know can be as much as once a second, it's going to recalculate its position solution. So you get a much increased uh, resolution of, of, of where the position is, uh, which can be really useful when you're live tracking uh, an ROV. Um, that's, that's very similar to how GPS works. Uh, I mean, if, if you take your phone out and try and get a GPS signal on it, you're not pinging the satellites uh, to, to then wait for a reply. You're just getting broadcast pings from, from the satellites. Uh, so, that, I mean, that's, that's exactly how GPS works. Uh, short baseline sort of turns this on its head. Uh, you, you only need to have one beacon deployed uh, subsea which you would calibrate into position. And then you would have multiple hydrophones located on, on the hull of the vessel. Um, you know the, the relative location of, of the hydrophones on your vessel. So when you receive a ping from the beacon, you work out the difference in, in time of flight and you can effectively calibrate, uh, you can effectively triangulate the, uh, the, the location of where you are relative to that beacon. Uh, ultra short baseline shrinks this down. So, um, rather than having multiple hydrophones on the hull of the vessel, you have one hydrophone that's got multiple elements in it. And, uh, and the, the sound, the ping that comes in from the beacon is received at different times through, that element, uh, through those elements. And you can triangulate where you are uh, relative to the beacon. So, I mean, typical parameters, uh, I mean, for example, the NASNET one, um, we, we operate around about 10 kilohertz. Uh, we, we achieve a four to five, in some conditions, further than that. Um, you know, we, we have a eight, 10 kilometer ranges, but it, it very much depends on the conditions. Uh, and, and with that, we achieve sub 10 centimeter accuracy. Um, so you know, quite, quite useful stuff. We could go higher frequency and potentially get higher accuracy, but, you know, it's at the expense of, of range. Uh, there are recent developments using inertial uh, navigation systems, um, such as gyroscopes, and these reduce reliance on, uh, on acoustic positioning. Um, the, you know, what, what it means is that um, you, know, the, the, you get a lot higher update from the inertial nav system, which would be on board your asset. Uh, you don't have to wait for, for pings, uh, for example. Um, so you can get a much higher, uh, a much higher update rate and uh, much improved tracking. Um, so it gives you higher accuracy, or it, it does allow vehicles to pass between areas of low coverage of beacons. So you wouldn't have to deploy, uh, you know, if you're traveling a long distance with your asset, you don't have to deploy beacons over all that area if, if you don't have to. So um, the, INS, the INS system can allow you to do that. However, uh, inertial nav systems, they can drift over time, so you, uh, you still need an acoustic position to, uh, to update uh, that, that, that position tracking. Um, I was, I was going to add in about the um, uh, sort of acoustic positioning as well for vessels, and you'd, you'd think, well, with GPS, why do we not just use 
GPS for vessels. Well, um, I mean, GPS is, is absolutely the primary method of positioning a, a vessel, but um, they can be affected by solar activity, uh, all, all the nice northern lights that we've been seeing over the past uh, few years, although I still have yet to see them. Um, the, they're a result, a result of high solar activity, and, and does that same solar activity can knock out GPS uh, signals. So, you know, if, if you end up losing your GPS, you lose your position uh, through through the vessel. So in some in some uh, applications, you need to have a backup method uh, and acoustics is, is one of those. Uh, other applications, uh, acoustic imaging, um, where visual cameras can't see through uh, water that isn't particularly clear, turbid water, sound can be used to produce an image, um, particularly used for navigation, uh, avoiding obstacles or identifying targets. Uh, the picture that we have here, um, one particular device looking down from a, a, a jetty up here, and you can see uh, things going on in the picture, you see the legs of the pier going out. Uh, you see objects in the water here, a big concrete block on the right hand side, other, other objects there. So um, very useful uh, tool to have on, on stuff like an ROV. Uh, typically longer range than, than visual cameras. The visual cameras maybe work over 100 metres, but uh, these might be effective over 300 metres range or, or more, depending on the frequency that they operate at. Um, typically working at, at multiple hundreds of kilohertz. Uh, as I said before, if you, if you go higher higher range, uh, higher frequency, you'd maybe get higher resolution, but at the trade-off of range. So, uh, you know, it's all a, a balancing act, really. Uh, we can use acoustics to do range measurements. Uh, acoustic altimeter is also regularly used on ROVs. A uh, method of, of measuring how high they are above the seabed. So, uh, you know, you avoid crashing into the seabed, which would be a pretty bad thing to happen. Um, works by transmitting a short ping from the device. You receive an echo from the target, for example, the seabed. And then that echo is received back at the device. And then you, you know the speed of sound. You uh, know how long it's taken for that echo to be returned to the, the device. And you can work out distance from that. Uh, an example here, uh, the, the impact subsea uh, ISA 500 altimeter, um, one that ASA will be able to tell you a lot about, uh, a lot more about, um, but it works on multiple hundreds of kil uh, kilohertz uh, frequency, effective over 120 meters, and, and they get one millimeter accuracy from that. Um, also got other uses, uh, it's, it's quite a versatile, versatile technology, uh, use it for wave height monitoring, stick on the seabed and point it up in, at, at the sea surface and you'll be able to measure the height of the waves or tide. Uh, scour monitoring, uh, that's a particular concern for uh, monopile wind turbines where you know you get erosion around where the, the base of the pile is. So you can stick a device such as this uh, on the base of the pile and check how how uh, you know what depth there is, and you know if you end up getting scoured around the the monopile, you'll get an increasing depth in in some locations where that that material has been eroded away. Uh, and flooded member detection, you can you can stick these devices up against uh, members of of for example for jacket structures, and if there's water within the member, the sound will, will propagate through the member and uh, reflect off the far side, so you can tell if it's it's flooded or not. So expanding from uh, from altimeters, uh, a sort of similar, uh, sort of similar technology, but um, bathymetry involves taking a, a, an array of measurements across a much larger area. Altimeters looking at, at, at one single dimension, um, but bathymetry expands that over a much larger area, taking uh, effectively depth or echo sounding measurements. Um, and, and these typically through uh, through toad arrays of, of multi-beam echo sounders. And what it does is, you know, it, it, it'll, rather than taking a single measurement, it'll take a, uh, an array of, mem of, uh, of measurements along a, a, a 2D slice. And then as that's toured along, it can stack up those 2D slices to make a, a 3D representation of terrain. And you get these, uh, these snazzy uh, bathymetry plots, which 
are extensively used in uh, offshore surveys, uh, seabed mapping, uh, both uh, pre-construction and for, uh, for as-built surveys um, to make sure everything's as you'd expect it to be. Uh, these again, typically effective over 300 meters range or, or, or perhaps further, working at multiple hundreds of kilohertz uh, again. And uh, sound identification, um, when we, we can use acoustic devices, uh, hydrophones to uh, listen to the ambient noise or, or detect what's happening in the water. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll think back to submarine movies where you see the, the sonar operator with the headphones on identifying particular classes of, of vessel or submarine. Um, and, uh, you know, I, th I think back to the Hunt for Red October where the, uh, the, the, the sonar operator wasn't able to identify the, uh, the, the Soviet class of submarine because it was using this fancy caterpillar drive, which was, uh, was silent and, and wasn't immediately recognized by the, the sonar operator. Uh, can be used for leak detection. If, if you've got gas leaking out a, a pipeline, it gives off a, a fairly loud uh, acoustic signature. Uh, so, you know, you can deploy hydrophones to uh, identify and, and alert the operator to, to that leak. Uh, can be used for diver uh, or intruder detection. Uh, Sonodyne have got a system for, for diver detection, whether it's um, around vessels or uh, ports, harbours. Um, and there's, there's increasing interest for identification of sea life and, and cetaceans. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of interest in, in, in doing that. Uh, I, I was also uh, speaking with uh, Jeff at, at Newcastle University about a project they had to uh, identify vessel traffic, uh, and they were using one of their uh, new acoustic devices to um, using the DSP on it to, to analyze the incoming noise and, and look for the signature of propeller cavitation. Um, gives off a, a, a fairly uh, recognizable uh, signature. And it would, it would analyze that coming in, it would, it would flag those up as events, as targets. And then it would use the same, of, same device as an acoustic modem and, and transmit that information, that status back to a gateway device, whether it was on a buoy or, a, or a, you know, on the beach. And one thing they found with this, it identified a marked reduction in vessel traffic due to uh, COVID lockdown. So, you know, no one was going out to sea to, to work. Um, so, and, and you know, the, the, the shipping channel was all very quiet until people started getting back to work and they identified a, a regular ramp up of, um, of, of vessel traffic. So, uh, yeah, interesting stuff. So to, uh, to draw a few conclusions, um, hopefully you'll see uh, through the information I shared that underwater acoustics, it's a very versatile technology, a lot, of, a lot of use cases, a lot of different things you can do with it. And it's no one size fits all, you know, frequency, data rate, range, battery life, deployment time, uh, what you need, what you want to interface to, you know, there's a lot of things you can do uh, to design versatile acoustic systems. And while other forms of uh, underwater wireless communication exist, acoustics is, is only the real solution if you uh, need wireless, if you need to get data wirelessly between the seabed and the sea surface. And uh, I'll sort of leave you with some of the points. Uh, I know the SUT Plus guys shared up uh, some, some points on social media uh, about positioning ROVs, uh, et cetera. But yes, I mean, we, we can position underwater vehicles and assets in, in more than a thousand meters water depth uh, and at multiple kilometers range. We can download data from AVs at multiple kilobits per second, uh, again at multiple kilometers range, and we can monitor sensors wirelessly and remotely, uh, avoiding runs of long and complex and expensive cable runs. And yes, we can see through water with zero visibility. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there with you. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. Um, I'll, I'll hand back to uh, Asa, uh, who will hopefully have some questions. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was really interesting uh, presentation.